Simon, tell us in 30 seconds who Simon Millman is. Just a bit of a snapshot. Yep, okay. So um, I'm the local member of state parliament for the uh, state seat of Mount Lawley, which takes in um, the suburbs of Mount Lawley, Yokine, and half of Dianella. I was elected to that position in um, March 2017. Uh, before that, I worked as a lawyer. I was a um, I was a partner for a while at Slater and Gordon, which is a well-known law firm down here on St George's Terrace. And then, um, after about uh, after about ten years at Slater's, about twelve years at Slater's, I, I left to set up my own law firm. And then um, from there, was elected to Parliament. I am married to my wife Tara, and we have two young sons. Um, uh, we live in Mount Lawley, uh, in a in a beautiful part of Mount Lawley. Um, I'm a social democrat. I'm an Anglican. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm really honoured to be a member of Parliament at the moment. And this is uh, a great summary of your current life and your Perth life, but you're not from Perth. My mum and dad lived in Torquay with my older brother Marcus in the, uh, I'll call it the late 1970s, and I was born at Geelong Hospital. Um, soon after I was born, my, my dad's a plasterer. He's retired now, but he worked as a plasterer for most of his working life. Um, and soon after I was uh, born, um, mum prevailed on dad to put the surfboard away and take out the trail and move up to Melbourne where there was going to be more work. And so... Yeah, so I don't, I don't remember much of Torquay and Geelong from, from when I was young. I was, I was still very young when we moved to Melbourne, grew up in Melbourne, went to school in Melbourne, um, and then moved across to WA when I was 19. What was the, the trigger there, then, Simon, to, to leave Melbourne? Okay, so I mentioned my older brother before, um, Marcus. When Marcus was, he's about six years older than me. Um, when he was 19, he left home and he moved to, um, he moved to far north Queensland. And, um, you know, we, we, all, we all stayed living in Melbourne, but Marcus struck out on his own and um, made a real fist of it, made a real success of it, moving, um, moving to another part of, of Australia. Um, when I got to about the same age, I had a couple of friends, uh, Dave, who, uh, who I'd been at school with, he finished school, he finished, sorry, his dad got a job over in Perth when uh, Dave was at the end of year 11, and so his, their, their family moved over here. And at the end of year 12, um, Another mate of mine, Tim, his dad also got a job in Perth. And so when I was about 19, um, my old man said to me, uh, you know, um, when he was your age, you know, Marcus had already left home and was living in Queensland. And I said, yes. And he said, well, you know, Perth's a beautiful city. And I said, well, I wouldn't know, Dad. I've never been there. And he said, you've got mates who live in Perth. And I said, yeah. And he said, you should try it. And so um, on, with their encouragement and, and um, my mate's parents, I put in an application to transfer my, I was studying at Melbourne Uni at that stage, I was studying an arts degree at Melbourne Uni, put in an application to transfer from Melbourne Uni to UWA and that was successful and yeah, came across. Do you occasionally sort of uh, sit back um, and think, why were my parents so keen to get rid of <laughs> and, and, and the, all my siblings? By the sound of me. Um, yeah, my sister, my, <laughs> my sister still lives um, in Melbourne, not far from where, from where mum and dad live. Um, uh, I think that, I, I don't, I don't, have to spend long reflecting on it because I think that they saw it as a real opportunity for personal growth, and I think that they thought it was a um, it was a good way for us to to really um, realise our potential. So yeah, so I think it's. If if there was a state of origin match tomorrow, yes, would you go for Victoria or for WA? Uh, in footy, I would go for Western Australia. In cricket, I can't get past my support for the Bush Rangers. I don't know what it is, but every time I watch Dean the Jones, cricket, less. Oh geez, I you know I was so sad when. Dino passed away. You know, I, I grew up watching Dean Jones, Simon O'Donnell, Murph Hughes, you know, even even Paul Rifle, you know, the great cricketers. And so, um, yeah, so definitely, there's definitely some affinity there. Although I am a, um, I'm a patron at the, uh, at the Mount Lawley District Cricket Club. So if we had any West Australians from the Mount Lawley District Cricket Club, there'd be, uh, there'd be um, competing loyalties. Well, it's just good to see that you sort of reverse the trend because we have so many, especially on the sporting field, course uh, West Australians heading over east yep. rather than the other way. Yep. So you transferred over here for university or got into university, yep. continued your studies, Yes. Um, got quite involved in student politics as well. It, it was it was really uh, one of my friends who said um, uh, not, not just student politics but the student guild more generally at UWA was um, was the place where things happened you know it was the place where people came together the societies clubs the public accounts committee you know the um, Sorry, the Public Affairs, Public Accounts yep. Committee is a committee of the Parliament, the Public Affairs Committee, um, uh, and you know the Education Society. This is where a lot of people came together to talk about how they could make the university really exciting, really interesting, really worthwhile, and, and, and deliver a great student experience. And so I got involved in the Guild in that way, and then um, and then one of my friends uh, ran for Guild President, and he asked me if I'd be on the ticket, and I, you know, I said sure, happy to be. And so yeah, I just found it a really rewarding experience, and went from there. And how that sort of clash or complement your studies? 
Uh, look, it was a it was a lot of it was a lot of juggling. It was a lot of juggling. Um, by the time I uh, by the time I came towards the end of my time as a as a student representative on the university senate, um, I was I'd, I'd already finished my politics degree and I was starting my law degree. And so it was a real um, it was a challenge. But you know, um, uh, if you want something done, get a busy person to do it. So you graduated with um, with two degrees then. Yeah. And um, and tell us about your. Uh first steps into the legal world. Yeah, okay. So um, uh, coming from Melbourne, when I was growing up, you'd always see stories about um, Slater and Gordon on the news and always uh, like class actions or uh, campaigning for justice for victims and things like this. And so I got a chance to go down to the uh, to do an interview with um, the managing partner of, of Slater's in Perth. Perth. And um, I was, I was, it was my dream job. It was absolutely my dream job. And so I was... Um, I was incredibly pessimistic about my prospects for getting the job, and so I was a bit more relaxed in the interview than I probably should have been. And I think, um, I think that uh, resonated with Hayden, and um, maybe show you, showed your true colours. Yeah. So well, I, I, I'm not sure what it was, but um, but he was happy with how the interview went, and he offered me a vacation clerkship, which was sort of a precursor to getting articles. And then, yeah, a few months later, um, yeah, they offered me articles, which was great. I was I was ecstatic to have had that opportunity. So yeah. And. Um, for, for the law graduates out there, um, or law students out there, how big is that transition from law school into articles or whatever you want to call it nowadays, into the work? I mean, how, how, how well prepared is one for actually entering the law? Uh, well, I've, I, I couldn't commend the UWA law degree highly enough. Like it was, it was a fantastic, it was a fantastic training, but um, uh, but it's a it's a very challenging transition, and it's a more challenging transition these days, I think. Um, one of the consequences we've seen of um, automation and AI and, um, and uh, uh, use of um, precedents and, com uh, and computers and so forth is that um, a lot of the routine tasks that are done by what used to be called article clerks, recent graduates now, um, a lot of that can be done automatically with, with uh, artificial intelligence. So, um, you know, as an article clerk, I could be searching through reams and reams of documents looking for particular documents that were um, relevant to the proceedings. Now you can feed them all into a computer, put in a keyword search, and, and that process is done. So I think it's a, real, it's a real challenge finding meaningful, worthwhile, intellectually challenging work for these really smart kids who are graduating from law school. That's the first problem. The other problem, I think, is, um, is the competition. So there's, there's an, an, a number of law schools in Western Australia. There aren't as many jobs for lawyers as there used to be. Um, again, in part because of automation and in part because of the way uh, uh, law firms are structured these days. Um, uh, so I think, and then, and then I think uh, the third challenge is that um, with the hex debts that they have as they come out of university, these, these graduates are, are desperate to try and find work to alleviate some of that pressure. Yeah. So, um, so it's a real struggle. So I can, I can, I can sympathise with them and only wish, wish them the best. Uh, the work that I've done with um, Curtin Uni Law School and, and UWA, I, I like to think helps um, uh, provide those law graduates with a bit of an insight into what into what lies ahead, and just to wish them well and you know wish them good luck. So you, you start at Slade and Gordon. Yep. Um, obviously, very excited about the firm, the firm's reputation. Yeah. But the political um, buzz didn't leave you there. Well, I don't. Um, what I think what I would say from my time as a representative at university and. Um, through my time as a lawyer and and now as a member of parliament, is it's always been um, it's always been about access to justice and seeking justice for for people. And I think um, I think uh, one of the great attributes of the guild was um, uh, our ability to represent the student community and um, and represent them in in debates or disputes with the university. And I found that um, really empowering. And I thought that the the law was a very powerful tool as well for getting for getting justice for people who'd been uh, who'd been wronged, you know, who'd been the victims of negligence or the victims of unfair dismissal or the victims of, of workplace injuries. And so um, I, I, always viewed it as, I always viewed it as a continuum um, rather than as a dichotomy. And, uh, and I, think, um, I think my latest role is a continuation of that continuum. I like to think that um, I'm here campaigning for justice for, you know, the people of Western Australia here trying to get the best the best that we can for the people of Mount Lawley. Can I just take you back to yeah. you know, the, the family dinner table in Melbourne? Yes. Um, as you said, you still can't, you were too young and tall key and uh, Geelong. Was there much political discussion around the dinner table? Absolutely, absolutely. So, Dad. So, the um, seeds might have been set 
um, seed sown very early here. Unquestionably, mm. unquestionably. Um, Mum and Dad always talk, talked about and talk about politics. You know, Dad's a, uh, Dad's a plasterer. Mum was predominantly stay at home, um, but did a bit of work as an education assistant, a bit of volunteering down at the school. Um, but yeah, we're always often talking about politics around the dinner table. Were they engaged or just very interested in, uh, in, in having these conversations? Interested in. Yeah. I, I remember the first politician I ever met was actually John Kane, and I didn't meet him until I was at uni, um, studying politics at, at Melbourne Uni, and he came along to give a lecture. And I was, I was, I was in awe because you know this is somebody that had been spoken of at the dinner table, and and here I was meeting him, and that was the first politician I met. So I remember it clearly. Yeah. And the guild over here obviously just sort of just cemented that further. Yeah. Um, at Slate and Gordon, you did quite a work, quite a bit of work um, with the same CFMU. Yeah. And got to know Mick, Mick Buckland very well. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, Mick, Mick and I, uh, how can I say this? Mick is now the secretary of the CFMU and doing an incredible job here in WA. But uh, before he became the secretary, Mick was um, responsible for occupational health and safety, you know, which is something that anyone who's, <laughs> who uh, sees what I say in parliament or, or, or reads, what I, um, reads what, I, what I write will see that, um, that it's something that I'm passionate about. And so as... Um, and so as I started at Slater's doing work as comp, Mick was the occupational health and safety officer. And so we had, we had a lot of, um, spent a lot of time working together. So yeah, so I think it's a, um, yeah, I think he's, a, he's an incredible man and he's a great, he's a great secretary of the union at the moment. So, yeah. what, what was sort of the defining moment um, that made you go, I'm going to shift into politics and seek pre-selection as you did in Mount Lawley? ahead of 2017. Uh, I'm going to throw um, my good mate Tim Hammond under a bus right now. <laughs> um, Tim lives around the corner from us in Mount Lawley and uh, his wife and my wife are great friends and Tara was on their, uh, on their bridal party when they, when they got married and, and Tim and I were having a chat one evening and he said, um, he said, why don't you? He said, you know, you... you um, a lawyer to lawyer chat? A lawyer, a lawyer to lawyer chat. He said, um, you know, you live, in, you live in Mount Lawley, you've lived in the neighbourhood for, for years, you got married at the local church. Your, your, your sons were both born at the local hospital. You know, people know who you are. You'd be a credible candidate. Why don't you throw your, your hat in the ring? And I thought it's a it's a persuasive. You know, as, as is usually the case when you're having a conversation with Tim Hammond, it was a persuasive argument. And um, yeah, I thought, well, there's there's nothing to lose. So I um, I went around, had a chat to a few mentors, a few friends, um, and got a sense of whether or not people thought that I'd be a credible candidate. And um, yeah, I was. Uh, pre-selected unopposed for, to run as the Labor Party candidate and it went from there. Can you still remember election night? Yeah, I do. I remember it quite clearly. What, yeah. um, at, at what stage did you... Well, talk, talk us through it. Yeah. Because we're now, you know, a couple of months out from, a, yeah. um, you know, a rerun. A rerun, yeah. Um, so it was, a, it, was a long, it was a long day and the, and the night before I hadn't slept much because there was a lot of... There was a lot of um, nervous energy, you know, plenty of butterflies in, in the tummy. And, um, and I'd finished up, we'd finished up at the, at the polling booth at about six o'clock. And my, um, my campaign director, Alana Clossy, Honourable Alana Clossy, member for the East Metro region, um, we, we went back to her house um, where we watched, uh, we watched the coverage on the, on the TV and, um, and our scrutineers at the various polling booths around Mount Lawley uh, were phoning in the results as they as they were coming through, and um, and we were, I was waiting. There. I was incredibly nervous. I was incredibly nervous because it was difficult to tell, you know, how we were going because it's a very, you know, at that stage it was a very um, it was a very marginal result, and so we weren't sure. But there was a, there was definitely a sense that a swing a swing was on, and um, and my supporters, the volunteers and, and supporters, had all gathered down at um, Mount Lawley Bowls Club, and so there was this question. Um, uh, there was this question about when we should leave Alana's house and arrive at the Mount Lawley Bowls Club. So it was all about it's all about the timing. And I remember watching the results come in, and I saw some incredible results. I remember seeing um, Darling Range had already been decided, and and Don Punch had already been announced in Bunbury. And so there were big swings. And I remember this fleeting moment of anxiety when I thought, what if the swing has missed us in Mount Lawley? What if we haven't worked hard enough? And then um, Phil, who's a campaign stalwart and who'd looked at all of the numbers had compared the booth results at various booths and he said yep I think it's time to get in the car and then we had calls coming from everywhere and so we arrived at um we arrived at the bowls club at Mount Lawley Bowls Club and um mum and dad had come over from uh from Melbourne for the for the election and um yeah came into the bowls club to a uh, a uh, raucous 
uh, reception, which was um, incredible. And yeah, and it was at about it was at about that time. It was sort of about quarter to eight where um, Anthony Green was calling it for for Mark McGowan and, and Labor, and it was yeah, it was just incredible. So yeah, how, how have those first sort of three and a bit years was stacked up then as a um, as a first time member of Parliament? Yeah based on or compared to your expectations or what, what people had, the advice they'd given you, has it sort of played out the way you thought it was going to play out? Yeah, that's a... And we'll get on to COVID later, but yeah, in a normal yeah, world. That's a, that's a great question. And, and it's a, um, and I'm glad that you mentioned COVID because there is a pre-COVID, post-COVID sort of um, uh, distinction that, that you need to make. Um, I don't know that I necessarily went in with any expectations. I mean, I look around at some of the, um, some of the incredible politicians who are elected into the Legislative Assembly uh, at the 2017 election, people like uh, Terry Healy, Cassie Rowe, uh, Amber Jade Sanderson, John Kerry, David Michael, people with a great deal of experience in politics, people who'd worked in politics, they'd been involved. And, um, and I, I'd always been interested in the Labor movement and, you know, I'd acted for trade unions and I'd always been um, keen to see uh, Labor win uh, state and federal elections, but I didn't have that intimate knowledge of the internal workings of parliament and politics the way some of my class of 2017 have. Um, so I didn't really go in with any particular expectations. I found it an incredibly rewarding job. Um, I found the, the uh, electorate of Mount Lawley to be incredibly um, sophisticated and incredibly engaged. Um, people are often coming to me and talking to me about issues and concerns um, and seeking my advice or assistance. Um, or, or advocacy, and so, uh, so that's all sort of in the in the pre-COVID environment. I also found it incredibly rewarding. Like, um, like I think about the, I think about the um, legislative reform agenda that um, John Quigley has prosecuted, and I think about um, uh, you know the expungement of historical homosexual uh, convictions, and that was just that was incredible and resonated with my community. I think about um, lifting the statute of limitations for. Uh, for victims of child sex abuse, so they can prosecute um, pedophiles. And I think about um, the implementation of some of the recommend recommendations from the uh, Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, recommendations that have been sitting there for 30 years waiting to be implemented, things like um, the fines enforcement uh, legislation that we got through last year, um, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the custody notification service and, and those sorts of things. And I just think... Um, We've done great work, you know. We've done incredible work in in the time in the time since I've been in Parliament, and it's been it's been an incredible privilege to be part of that because I know that for those groups in the community, the legislation that we've passed has provided them with access to justice, which brings me all the way back to where I started, you know, when I was growing up with mum and dad, when I was at university, and when I was a lawyer. So yeah, coming past that post COVID, um, what an incredible challenge. I mean, it's just I I gave a speech on Wednesday night about in reply to the budget that Ben Wyatt had, um, had presented to the parliament. And I just, um, I just sang the praises of the cabinet because it's an incredible team who've tackled COVID. And I think, um, I think the work being done by, um, by the Premier, by Roger Cook, by Michelle Roberts, um, by Ben Wyatt, you can just see that, um, that this is a cabinet working cohesively to try and uh, preserve and protect uh, the community of Western Australia to try and um, look after our best interests and put us on the best possible footing to move on to the next stage. So yeah. But how has that changed, then, Simon, uh, from a from a local election approach point of view? I mean, you would have door knocked yourself silly in the lead up to twenty seventeen. Yep. Um, I, I know we live in a in a much happier place than say your parents in Melbourne yeah. at the moment. But how has that whole election process? From a retail, from a household point of view, how's that going to change? Yeah, so it already it already has changed. It already has changed um, uh, during uh, during May and June, and also during the the parliamentary winter recess. We I spend a lot of time um, making calls to seniors. We've got we've got a, a, a fantastic seniors community in Mount Lawley. Um, there's a lot of the retirement homes on Alexander Drive that you would know, um, and so and so calling people. Uh, for branch meetings, we had Zoom meetings like everybody else. We had um, policy committee meetings online. Um, uh, there was a lot of letter writing and letterboxing. We got our volunteers out, out letterboxing. Um, there was a there was a general reluctance to get too much door knocking going in in May, June, and July. We're back out door knocking now. Um, 
uh, one of the great things about uh, door knocking was, you know, the, 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 the connection, the handshake with, with, your, with your constituents and, and the eye contact. Um, these days, you know, the, the screen door remains closed and I'm at the back of the doorstep and, you know, and there's, there's, a, there's a good social distancing that takes place. But that, um, that uh, communication element is still present. And I think, that's, I think that's really important. I think being a, a member of parliament or politics generally is about reciprocity. Um, I can only be a good advocate if I hear from my community about what they need me to advocate for. Um, and I get a real strong sense of that when I'm out there speaking to people um, whilst door knocking. So, yeah. And, yeah, you, you touched on a very good point. Um, but of course, unfortunately, what we've seen is probably a, um, a worldwide, in the Western world, a sort of gradual sort of lack of trust in, in the political process, um, disengagement with the yeah. electorate. Yeah. And then he puts the COVID situation over the top. Yeah. Where... You, you, you know, it, it makes it more difficult. And there's only so many Zoom meetings you can do. And yeah. only so many times you can talk through a uh, you know, security screen. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that real face-to-face -face contact is really important. It is, it? it is vital. It is vital because people need, to, people need to be able to connect with their local member of parliament. And um, Bill Johnson tells me that, um, that when, when surveys are done, there's, a, there's an uncertainty about or a scepticism about politics generally. In, in, in response to the first question. But when um, members of the public are asked, but what about your local member? Uh, the level of engagement goes up. You know, people go, well, I actually might, you know, I don't really think about my local member as a politician. I just think about him as the, as the dad with kids at the school or the guy that I see down the shops. So, or, you know, or the woman, but I'm speaking from my own experience. But, um, you know, so, so I think, um, I think it's, it's incumbent upon the current uh, uh, group of members of parliament to do to do what we can um, to restore democratic processes in the eyes of the community. Um, I haven't been able to um, tear myself away from the US presidential election and, um, and I'm worried, you know, I'm just sort of scared about what happens with those, you know, democratic institutions because they're so important. You know, you're in Kings Park, you're down the, we're 200 metres from the War Memorial. People have sacrificed a lot for us to live in a democracy and we've got to, we've got to honour that sacrifice and we've got to make sure we do what we can in order to preserve those institutions for, for my sons, you know, your sons, yep. for, the, for the next generation coming through. And an ambivalence or a complacency about that is problematic. You are, um, you've got a young family. Yep. What sort of toll does, be, does a, a politician's life sort of, you know, play out on the family? I mean, we've, there's been some good stories, Tim Hammond being a good story. Yeah. Of course, the travel over east, um, it's a totally different layout. Yeah. Yeah. But even at a local level, I mean, what does a typical week look like for the member from Mount Lawn? Um, so, the 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 answer is self discipline, right? So I, I I drop my boys at school on a Monday morning and I pick them up on a Monday afternoon. I drop them at school on a Friday morning, and whenever I can, I pick them up on a Friday afternoon. So at least there's a little bit of time when I'm always, you know, when I'm when I'm when I'm connected with them. Um, you know, I take them uh, during the footy season. I take them to the footy at um, Hamer Park uh, on a Sunday morning, and so there's a there's that time that you, you've got to be self disciplined about about carving out the time that you need. That's the first thing. Second thing is, it would be impossible to do it without a supportive partner. You know, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, um, a, a, as a parent. You, you can't. Um, uh, so that's the that's the second thing, and and. Um, Tara is, is incredible and thoughtful and uh, considerate and supportive. Um, uh, and then the third thing is, um, the third thing is, uh, you, you've got to think, for me, I, I think about what I did before I was in Parliament and, and, a, and, a, and a regular week for a partner at a law firm on St George's Terrace is probably 70 or 80 hours a week. And so, so is it a marked change? Yes. Is it, is it 7 a.m.? To 8 p.m. Monday to Saturday, the, the way it was when I was working as a lawyer. No, it can be 7 a.m. until 2 a.m. or it can be, you know, 2 p.m. until 10 p.m. Um, so it might be the same number of hours, but there's a great variability in the hours. And so the trick, I think, is to catch time with your family in those hours that you're free. And so you've just got to be disciplined and you've got to be supportive and you've got to be thoughtful. So, yeah. Now, this will seem like a silly question because uh, you were the first Labor member for Mount Lawley and you won it in 2017, yep. but what, le what lessons were learned um, for, uh, that you can use to defend your, your, your seat in yeah. March? Uh, I, think, I, think there are probably, um, I think there are probably three reasons why I'm the first 
a Labor member from Mount Lawley. I think I would say, um, uh, I would say uh, the seat the seat has changed over time. Um, you know, we've got we've got young professionals, we've got young um, families, we've got um, people who are interested in the in the world, we've got people who are interested in social justice, people who are interested in the environment, and so I think there are a number of people who who've moved towards um, Labor. I think the second reason is that we worked, as you say, we worked incredibly hard. We knocked on, you know, plenty of doors. We made plenty of phone calls. We did leafleting, letterboxing. We were out there, um, outdoor offices, forums, as much as we could do. And so um, you'll see all of that again in, in, in this campaign. Um, and I think the third reason is that um, there was a real appetite for change in, in the community. Um, we were putting forward a, a positive vision built around um, Mark McGowan built around his strong cabinet, um, built around you know a whole a whole bunch of policies, and I think um, I think the uh, the the Liberal Party made a couple of strategic missteps in um, in Mount Lawley, and I think not not the least of which was uh, um, their pledge to privatise Western Power. I mean that 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 sat strangely because people in Mount Lawley appreciated that um, you couldn't have a coalition government with. The Liberals on the one hand saying they'll privatise Western Power to pay for their election promises and the Nats on the other hand saying that they didn't want to privatise Western Power. So there was a, um, and, and, and you know, people in Mount Lawley are sophisticated and, and they understood that that was going to be difficult for them to achieve. So there was a scepticism there. And I also think, um, you know, people uh, in Mount Lawley appreciate the diversity of the community that they live in. And so there was a, um, there was a strong sense of uh, dissatisfaction with the Liberal Party for doing that deal with One Nation and what One Nation stood for. And so, um, yeah, so I think that, that that was the constellation of circumstances. I don't think we'll have the same issues this time round. I'm, I'm, I think it would be insane for the Liberal Party to do a, a deal with One Nation this time round. Um, uh, and I don't think they'll run on a platform of privatising Western Power. I suspect they'll have learnt their lessons from last time. So I think those issues are, have gone. Um, I think Mark McGowan has really... Uh, has really come to the fore over this first term of, of, as, as Premier. And I think um, people really know who he is. They, they understand what he stands for. They understand what he's about. And I think that will, um, that will stand us in great stead in Mount Lawley. And I hope, I hope that in the work that I've done over the four years that I've been Member of Parliament, uh, people understand who I am as well and what I'm, what I'm about and you know, what, the, what they can expect to get if, they, um, if they're prepared to place their trust in me in the next March. And of course, you've gone from being the chaser to being the chase. Yeah, well, that... <laughs> Simon, um, Mount Lawley is a, is a large and diverse electorate. It's actually the smallest electorate geographically in the state. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a multifaceted electorate. It is a multi... Put it that yeah, way. yeah, absolutely. And, and, and population-wise, yeah. very diverse. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, and it's also more than Beaufort Street. It is more than Beaufort Street. We always think about Beaufort Street. Yeah. What can be done to revitalise that whole precinct? Yeah. I'll, I'll make I'll make uh, two points um, before I answer the question. The first is um, uh, the first is I Kyron O'Donnell, the the Liberal member for Kalgoorlie, constantly jokes with me about the size of his electorate compared to the size of my electorate. It is it's still seventeen square kilometres, and it, it takes in all of those suburbs that I mentioned before, and you know it takes in you know places like Dog Swamp Shopping Centre and Dianella Plaza and all of the rest of it. Um, uh, but Beaufort Street. You know, Beaufort Street is the, you know, it's probably one of the most well-known streets in Perth. It's an evocative street. People, people, it resonates with people. And, um, and you know, as, as uh, businesses everywhere in Western Australia, or in fact, everywhere around the world, um, you know, our retail business have been, have been struggling with, with the COVID pandemic. Um, some might say that that predates the pandemic and, and, um, and there's probably a constellation of circumstances that give rise to the struggle of uh, small business retail on, on high streets. Um, there are, there are um, institutional changes. There are, there are changes to the way people, there, there are changes to the habits people um, have when they're shopping. There are changes to the way people order food. You know, um, the, uh, the, Bo the Beaufort chemist, which used to be a 24 hour chemist um, near the corner of Walcott Street there, a lifesaver when my boys were babies. Um, has gone to being uh, no longer 24 hours. And the proprietor of that chemist said, you know, he would come out of the chemist, he'd walk out of the front door at two o'clock in the morning some nights and he'd see Beaufort Street and there'd be people up and down the street. Um, nowadays, he, he steps out onto the footpath and he, all he sees is um, uh, Uber Eats and Deliveroo riders. And so there's a change in, there's a change in the way people do things. Um, 
one of my sources of optimism for Beaufort Street is that um, the good businesses have persevered and they've prevailed, um, and new businesses have come along, and they've got a um, they've got a new business model. I think I think the good entrepreneurialism relies on innovation, and so the good businesses that have got a local connection with the community that have got um, a point of difference, they've got a they've got an experience to offer. Those businesses are doing well, and I think because Beaufort Street remains an iconic street, um, I'm confident for its future. We hope so. Um, just a couple more questions to finish up, Simon. Yep. Your favourite place in WA? Well, here's not too bad. <laughs> this is pretty special. Um, home. I love my house. I love where I live. Um, uh, and two others. Um, I love taking the dog. It's outside the electorate. We don't have a dog beach in the electorate. More's the pity. Um, but I love when I've got Jet in the car coming over the hill to the dog beach at um, Pearsall Street, just, just south of Scarborough Beach there. And um, he gets so excited. And as you see the Indian Ocean, there's endless possibilities. When you look out over the Indian Ocean, you can just see, you know, um, it just makes your mind expand and you think there's so much that can be done. So, and then the other one, and this is when I knew I was, um, I'd finally, I'd finally become a, a Western Australian. Um, I will decide that for you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> When I, I, you know, the um, I used to travel a bit for work, and um, and driving home to Mount Lawley from Perth Airport, you come across. Uh, I, I, I come down Tonkin Highway, and as you come across the Swan River, and you look to the west, you look to the left out of your out of your window, you can see down the river. So it's surrounded by trees, but you see the skyline, the Perth city skyline emerge, and I just love, and I got the sense that I was home. You know, so every time I every time I get off the plane and. Um, you know, get in the car to, dr to drive home from Perth Airport, and I, I see the city skyline out of the window. I just, yeah, I just, I love, I love that bridge. So I hope when um, Rita Safiotti fixes the Tonkin Gap through Bayswater, that you're still able to see. That. I need to mention that to her that you're still able to see the Perth City skyline from the Tonkin Highway Bridge. No pressure, so, Rita. Yeah. <laughs> last, last holiday for the Milman family. Uh, we went to the Chittering Valley. Yeah, yeah, we went to the Chittering Valley. Just a little, um, a little Airbnb farm stay. So. Um, Simon, as a Victorian who now calls WA home, um, why didn't you lobby harder for the AFL Grand Final to be played at Optus Stadium? Yeah, it's a um, it's a fair question, um, but I think I'm I'm probably in in, in two minds. I, I did say that I thought that the Grand Final should be at, at, at Optus Stadium, but in hindsight, given the um, given the coronavirus, it's it's probably it's probably for the best that we keep um, we keep the situation as it is. Um, uh, I also think, you know, I also think there's money involved, um, and I think that the Queensland government had to put up a, a fair bit of cash to the AFL to encourage them to go to Queensland. And I think um, one of the things that we've learned from Ben Wyatt is he's fastidious and disciplined when it comes to spending money, and um, and he'll focus on spending uh, he'll focus on spending treasury dollars on what he thinks and what what we feel can get the best results for. For the community, so you know, never say never. Hopefully, one day we'll see a grand final at Optus Stadium. It is a fantastic, it is a fantastic uh, community asset, and it's a um, it's a great place to watch the footy. Twenty twenty one, maybe. Final <laughs> question, Simon. Where, where do you see yourself in ten years' time? Um, I love that question because it always gives you an opportunity to think about what the what the future might hold. Um, I love this job, and I, I'd love to be I'd love to still be doing this job. I'd love to still be representing the the, um, the people of Mount Lawley in in the state parliament. It's an incredible honour. Um, if I'm not, then that's okay because uh, with any luck, I'll be back doing another job that I love, and that is practicing law and um, you know and fighting for justice for victims. And, and that was also a great job. So so if I'm in if I'm one, in one of those two places or on the bench back here on the bench, then. I'd be, I'd be more than happy. That'd be fantastic. Well, we wish you all the luck in, yeah. uh, in March. Yeah, thanks, Simon, uh, thank you for that. Before you go, we've just got a, a short word association. We call it the Fast 30. The Fast 30. I'm not entirely sure why. We haven't yeah. got 30 words. So it's <laughs> going to take more than 30 seconds. Okay. But if you're ready to go... Um, take a deep breath. your one, best, one word best answer. One word. All right. Is there, is there any latitude? I'll be the judge of that. Okay. Simon Moomer. Parliament. Uh, Honour. Constituents. Sophisticated. Election night. Long. Secession. A bad idea. COVID. Unprecedented. Beaufort Street. Iconic. Bureaucracy. Worthwhile. Lawyers. Uh, justice. Class actions. Uh, necessary. Trade unions. Oh, indispensable. Whitner. Tragic. Mark McGowan. Focused. Lisa Harvey. 
inconsistent. Mia Davies. Rural. Mick Buchan. Dedicated. The media. Hardworking. Twitter. Oh, insular. First City Council. Interesting. West Coast Eagles. Inspirational. Simon Milne. Thank you very much for joining us on the bench today. Peter, thank you for the privilege. It was great to be here and great to talk. Thank you.